what we don't want to do is cause more pain and suffering and cause people to be re-victimized in church where they're supposed to find hope, healing, and restoration. Well, hey, everybody. My name is Slavik, and I have Paul again on the podcast. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you know this, but it's been a month since we did our last podcast. Yeah, indeed. It's been a month for sure. Bro, I am, I'm excited. I, ha- I heard a lot of uh, people um, that reached out to me because of, of that podcast. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of continue talking about this topic that we started. Um, so, but before I do that, I wanted to ask you, what was some of the responses you heard about that first podcast that we did? Hmm. Uh, good question. Um, thank you, Slav, for having me back on the podcast. A um, couple of responses I had from my young people that called me and actually said, hey, thank you guys for bringing up this kind of conversation among Slavic community. Um, it's much needed, especially as um, people, you know, they go in a quest for their faith. They would like to figure out what's going on. And they ask a lot of questions like, hey, what is this movement or what is this particular teaching and how do we discern and so on? So I think a lot of young people are in a need of it. And at the same time, I think body are, um, uh, let's say the body of Christ needs to speak more of those kind of issues that are coming up and uh, not be afraid of talking. And And I think uh, one of the things I'll point out, I, uh, I'm, I like how we pray during the, before the, podcast and we prayed and uh, you said something in a prayer very interesting that God help us not to slander anybody um the point and in, in, in the point we're trying to do is to bring awareness but not bring a slander to any particular uh, for example persona or anybody particular circle of groups but bring up awareness hey guys there is a murky teachings there and we got to be very careful and um, be make sure we don't get spiritually sick so and I think a lot of those young people that called us and like hey um, thank you so much for bringing up those things, those issues, and having that uh, as our main goal to bring a discernment is what we're trying yeah. to do. Yeah, and I think that's exactly it, man. I I thought about it a lot. I prayed a lot about this, and and again, I love the local church just like as much as as you do, Paul. Um, I think the local church is where people find community, where people find first hear the gospel a lot of times. The local church was where people get discipled. And I think we need more local churches. My mom used to say, I used to be part of um, uh, a church in, in Canmore. And she's like, man, Slavik, how many campuses do you need? And I'm like, mom, there's about 70,000 people in this city. So <laughs> we want to reach the people in our city. And I, I believe that um, the local church is one of the best ways. And, you know, it wasn't really my idea. It was Jesus who said, I'll build my church. <laughs> you know, in the hell, uh, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, but with that said, I do think that a lot of times, maybe because of lack of training, or maybe because, you know, there's really big per- personalities and people that, you know, they're not ready to kind of be a pastor or a, um, I don't know, someone in leadership. And because of that, we see uh, things that I think need to be addressed in, in, in churches. And um, again, our whole podcast, we're not hoping to talk about how many songs do you play in the, in the service, where should the sermon be 35 minutes or 45 minutes? Like we're trying not to address the form or style of worship. I think it, it takes all kinds of churches to to reach all kinds of people, right? Like, And there's different styles, like different people worship differently. That's not the point. The point we're trying to address is some of the theological um, problems that we see and how I, I think a lot of times in the modern church, we have moved away from the basics of our Christian faith, like knowing scripture and, you know, leading through uh, with first starting with prayer, then be corrected by by scripture and so on and moved into a more like, oh, do you feel like this or do you feel like that? And it's more about feelings, experiences, and that's what we want to to talk about that we should pursue the Lord and grow in our faith, not pursue certain experiences because that leads us to highs and lows. So, um, uh, Paul, uh, one question that I had for you is, um, what are some of the practices that you've seen where people have chased an experience, but they came back? Uh, recently, I actually, right after the first podcast, I had a girl that, uh, that reached out to me and said, and she wrote me this massive text message. And she's like, Slavik, I spent... 10 years going from one extreme to another. And I got to a point where I had to burn my theological 
journals because I would go to, from one extreme of only scripture and then to another extreme. So, so the, the best way to describe it is one extreme, you're only in your head with knowledge, but another extreme is you're always in your heart, but you're not worshiping the Lord your God with all your mind and with your heart with everything. So these are the things that, um, that if they're not addressed, I think a lot of people can burn out. Uh, indeed. Uh, I think um, what you're trying to, I guess, explain or at least touch base on those young folks and young people like us. I know in my personal journey, I know most of the young people were in a quest of uh, finding Christ. And and often enough, that is uh, basically been um, packaged. Well, this is the way you find Christ now, or this is the movement that will help you come and activate certain truth of gospel or certain truth of um, whatever it might be, that experience. So and I think often enough when we don't balance it correctly in the light of the scripture, I would say. So the word of God actually says in John that, that we should love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and strength. And one of the things when it comes uh, strength, we forget the part that it requires my action, my attitude, and everything that within me uh, to go out and pursue that. And uh, often enough, we would, um, it, it, there's a term they use it, I guess, it's not my term, but I, I heard it's called comp, uh, conference hoppers. Um, and it's actually a very interesting term where people would run after conference and hop to another conference to find a, um, they call it at least a meaning or experience of God in their life. And I think that's where danger is, going from one completely aspect to completely another aspect, going from conference to conference hopping. So the danger will be there where you starve yourself spiritually. And in those risks, you're more prone to highs. For example, if you have a lot of caffeine, right, you get jittery and all that. But let's say if you go fast for a week with no caffeine in your body, what happens then? You take any sip of coffee, you feel that rush coming in. In the same way spiritually, for example, people would run you know, from one conference, one te uh, teaching or one type of speaker to another to get that particular dose of that spiritual high. Uh, forgetting that they already have the, the the word of God right before them, they just need to open up and start reading the word. And if you don't know, if when you're reading, you don't see the word is actually changing your mind, renewing your mind, well, start praying, Lord, I want this living word start speaking in my heart, my mind, my soul, and and, re and remove all the residue. Uh, what's interesting, Slav, um, on this particular topic, I had a, a, a conversation with our youth and, and the message that it came is, um, you know how we look at any vessel or for example, uh, we have certain stuff at our home, cups, mugs, coffee mugs, and so on. If you put the nice coffee mug on a side, right? And from a side, it looks beautiful. There's outside, it's all clean. And Jesus talked about being hypocrite about hypocrisy, right? Being clean outside, but inside you have a dirty residue. And I tell people, well, imagine if you get a coffee mug from somebody, some friend house, and it looks nice outside, outside, but you pick inside, it is a residue. You, right away, you don't want to use that kind of cup. And, and mm. same thing spiritually, we have a lot of residue maybe inside, but outside we run to get all this polished out, find the truth. And yet after conference, you walk out, but you feel empty because that residue remains there. But yet you had a little experience, somebody, uh, I mean, sound weird, but somebody might grab the cup, you know, hold it for a second. You felt respected, you felt loved and cared, and you felt that you were accepted it. And then suddenly they look inside like, oh, yuck, let me put the cup down. And often of those people that running to those, you know, conference hopping or spiritual high seeking, they experienced that uh, they were being held or touched by spirit or by God, they say. But then later on, they walk out, they feel empty. And the word of God says, well, wait a minute. Uh, God says, I want to actually clean from inside out. And often mm -hmm. enough, that's where I think the disconnect happening, where we don't allow the word of God to clean us with inside out. And therefore, we run experience after experience, not pausing for a moment and say, wait a minute. Lord, I actually need to define what kind of relationship I have with you. Am I just a cup on a display? Or is that cup that you want to use that you look inside and be like, hey, there's a residue. And the word of God says that you need to be born again and born of water and a spirit. And I say, guys, water, you cannot wash a cup, right? If you need to bring water in it. And the spirit is it's like that detergent or that soap that comes in and the residue starts washing away. Allow the word of God start washing your mind, your heart, your soul. And that way you will prevent a lot of spiritual sicknesses that we can get, you know, when we go in those, uh, chase those kind of experiences. And there's nothing wrong, guys, to uh, to experience God 
in a, in our fleshly vessel, but it's completely wrong if our vessel inside is dirty, if there is a residue, if there's stains. We're like that messy, ugly cup. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's just, man, I, when I grew up, uh, when I was growing up, rather, um, I wanted to work out and like, uh, you know, do the bodybuilding thing. And you just kind of research and you, you're you looking at it, it's like, okay, well, you have to take in protein and creatine and all these supplements, right? So it's like, and you think, okay, the more that I take protein, and if you, that's all you take is creatine, protein, and all these things, then this is going to make you stronger. So what I try to do is kind of circumvent the process of actually growth, right? Like now is protein a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. You should have protein for you to grow. But when you think that the more protein that you have, that, the, you know, the, the more muscles you're going to build, there's something wrong with that. Namely is that you're trying to circumvent the working out plan, the sleeping plan, right? The resting plan, right? So, so for you to actually be able to get healthy or grow, you have to go through that process of working out, making sure that you eat a good diet, right? Then you might take some supplements, but supplements are just that. They're supposed to supplement, and then you need to rest. And it seems like in churches, we take the same approaches a lot of time. We like to circumvent the whole process of, you know, being submitted under someone's authority at church, you know, being in community or being challenged and 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 constantly called out. We we, we don't like to, to go through that process, right? When we're told that we have to serve at church where, um, I don't know, like do the things that people don't think that are that exciting, right? So instead what we do is we want to go to the supplement, the the important thing, like the conference, right? Now, of course, just like protein, a conference could be a good thing. Is just when that's all you pursue. Uh, and this actually, uh, kid you not, this actually happened to me where um, we got peanut butter from the USA. At that time, I lived in Moldova. And I've never had peanut butter. But I also heard that it's really good for building muscles. So I just ate a whole bunch of it. And I am, I'm not joking when I say that's been so many years since then, even the smell of it makes me sick. So, and it's, my friends know this, they always joke about this. Um, why? Because I so over ate peanut butter in those three days. Now I threw up after that and all, but since that moment, I have this repulsion when it comes to peanut butter. And if that kind of like by way of, of bringing that as, a, as an illustration, a lot of the things that you desire to, to experience with God, those are not bad things. But when you choose to you know, pursue that instead of God himself, at some point, you know, after you've had your fill, you might be repulsed against that. So, I mean, do we believe in healing? Absolutely. It's just when you pursue healing instead of the Lord, that's problematic. Do we believe in, in you know, God speaking into our hearts. And, and of course we do. But when we remove that from everything else and all we want is a specific gift uh, of, of the Holy Spirit or a specific uh, gift of, of the giver, um, you're putting the focus on the wrong place, you know? And for me, it's, it's I, I didn't grow any stronger. All I ended up with is me throwing up and getting sick. Why? Because I wanted to circumvent the actual process of growth, of eating right and, and getting rest and so on. Same thing here. It's like we want you to spiritually grow, but that's going to come at the cost of making sure that you don't circum circumvent the whole process. Amen. You know, um, you know you, you, I mean, I think you're touched based on something very uh, practical. Often enough in our Christian or let's say uh, walk with the Lord, we try to have a dualism in our life, right? We split, this is good, this is bad. And we often forget that idea that God created us first to be in a physical body and then spiritual body. So our senses to the world, it goes through physical first, right? So that's how we uh, seize the world and so on. So and often enough, we're trying to grasp the spiritual side of us. And like you say, uh, find a quick shortcut. How do we 
build up our spiritual body quickly and all of that. And I tell people, wait a minute, just as a natural body requires the proper steps to grow, same yeah. thing, spiritual uh, process has to form. And I think we always forget and it's some um, guys, we let's bring us back to the to the basics of our structure, how we are as a humans, how God designed us. And then therefore, everything that we will do, and if we do it in proper order, the way God designed us, we can grow naturally in the spiritual uh, bodies as well. Because we could, like, say, for example, if we don't practice uh, uh, self-discipline, right, in our, um, let's say, in our daily lives, then we will struggle in a lot of aspects of our lives, you know, with our school, with the work, you know, commitments and so on. But that goes exactly the same way for spiritual aspects. So if you want to have, I call a, a you know, Starbucks Christianity drive by and you get all of this right away. I mean, you will lose right away your hope in Christ once you hit any kind of crisis. So it's like a, trying to be a bodybuilder, like you mentioned, but abusing the process of it, abusing the process of working out, you know, sleeping properly, eating proper nutrition and so on. And of course, doing proper uh, training. So I think the same exactly way it goes to our spiritual formation. And that's why where people would run, for example, well, you know, if you take this particular shake or that particular drink, it will give you that particular energy for that moment that you build up the bo the boost in your in your walk. That that's good. It's temporarily, but is that what will make you it grow? No, consistency, discipline, and uh, self discipline. The Word of God says, right, one of the fruit of the Spirit. Those what makes and forms us as a believers. Same way. Um, so I think this uh, idea of us chasing high, of mm -hmm. Christian high, it's the same way as physically we're trying to find a shortcut how to get, let's say, you know, rich quickly. There was one time, I don't know if you remember, right when the um, crypto start becoming popular and a lot of youngsters and us, we're all kind of, oh, this is exciting. I can retire early. And I, and I had a friend of mine that he, he did really good at the first couple of months. I mean, he did really good. And um and then he thought he's going to pull out and retire. And next thing you know, that company he invested in, uh, the tokens he was he bought from crypto, they went bankrupt. So all of that money that he invested just disappeared overnight. So think of this way: idea of get quick something results or find some quick solution. Uh, they are temporarily they come and go fast, and that's where people can get discouraged. And that's the danger after side effect after highs. It would be abuse and burnouts where people no longer would like to pursue, let's say, either that might be a crypto investment or that might be whatever that might be if they got burned in it. Same way it goes spiritually. I just actually got off the phone from one of the pastors where we're discussing. He's like, he asked me one thing. He's like, you know what he noticed observing certain uh, type of people that would run after those highs? He goes, I observed after that they burn out and they don't want anything to do with God. And I said, that's exactly what we've been kind of seeing when we've been studying this subject. The more people try to go that direction by pursuing all those, only the highs, right? They never go down lows because in their theology, there is no lows. If you have a low, if you're sick, that means you either don't have enough faith or B, you've been cursed by God. So therefore, their theology is now kind of living always in the high scale, but in the practical side of it, we all go through some troubles. We all go through some suffering. We all go through some concerns, anxiety, and worries. The Bible does forewarn that. So, But when you have that obscure theology, like you mentioned, a good point of protein, right? If you only consume protein, 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 then your body starts having an allergic reaction to it. Like, hey, wait a minute, there's something non-healthy. And, and if you listen to your body and do respond what it says, wait a minute, I need a break from protein. And it's good. And I tell people, hey, guys, God made us in the same, same way spiritually. Imagine if I only chase the highs, but I never go through the valley. I never sit down and talk and, and I never get exam my, uh, my life of my faith, why I believe. And I'm not being challenged in those areas. Any storm will come. Any, any kind of uh, hardship will come. The word of God says, just like a parable that Jesus spoke. What happens? Yeah. We, will, we were down. That's it. You won't be able to pass through that particular season in your life. Therefore, there's definitely danger by consuming only protein or chasing only high in your life. But I can always imagine uh, somebody's probably listening to this podcast saying, well, you guys are just trying to do things on your own and you guys are not like trusting God because God can accomplish so much in five seconds that he, you know, and I think there's a, there's a place for that. But I, 
I'd also want to point to the burden that places on people that, hey, you always have to kind of like pretend like everything is good. Um, I actually talked to a student. I was at a, a retreat and she used to go to a pretty big church and she used to sing on stage. And so then she said, hey, I, I, I left that church. And I'm like, why did you leave that church? I said, well, Slavik, you know, it was, it was awesome because I was on stage and all the lights and the cameras and all of that. It was exciting. But then you get off stage and you're just as empty as you went up there, right? So this idea that we don't allow people to actually process their, you know, their sorrow or their lows to actually go through uh, some of the greatest spiritual lessons that I've learned in my life is when I was at the at the valley, you know, in the in the lowest of low, and either I lost my dad and I have to really, you know, huddle with the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, what do I? What do I really believe about you? Because right now this really, really hurts. But I don't see a lot of that. It's just, hey, if you if you love the Lord, it has to be all hype. But we don't want to allow for people to go through the periods of, of difficulties. And here's the thing. Even Jesus himself, I mean, could have Jesus snapped everyone into perfection? I think he could have. He's God. He could have snapped Peter into perfection. He could have snapped John and James and all the disciples into perfection, but that's not what he did. He discipled them. He walked with them, right? You know, he he saw Peter at his best and he saw Peter at his worst, but, you know, he allowed Peter to go through this broken sanctification process of, of ups and downs and you know, when he was at his low, Jesus encouraged him. And when he needed to repent, a conviction came and he 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 repented. But, you know, he didn't snap Jesus. Uh, Jesus did not snap uh, uh, Peter into perfection. And this idea that somehow go into a conference, you'll be snapped and all your problems will just go away. Now, I know like nobody really believes that on a face value. But we believe that with our actions a lot of times. Like I've, I've heard so many people tell me, well, Slavik, I don't understand. I'm doing all these things, but somehow I don't see the power of God in my life. I'm still dealing with, with the same brokenness as I've dealt with. And my question to them is, but have you surrendered? Have you repented? Have you allowed the Lord to break you even further, you know, so you would actually focus on the right things? Have you done the sanctification process? Have you learned how to die to your will and die to you being on the throne of your life and accepting Jesus? And, and that takes dying to your to your dreams and your passions daily and embracing God's, you know, God's word and uh, God's will and God's, you know, purpose for your life. And this idea that somehow we can just get a shortcut, you know, if I if I just get the right prophet and the right man of God to pray over me, everything will be perfect. And it's like, I don't know about that. You know, the disciples had Jesus with them and Jesus allowed them to go through the process of discipleship and sanctification and dying to oneself and in learning, right, under Jesus and growing in the faith. You know, it wasn't like snap and you're perfect type of thing. Yeah, um, Slav, I think it's just overall, I think when people hear that kind of gospel, it saddens me to see that people fall onto this type of, uh, let's say, teaching, right? Where they start following and they try to uh, live out the best life they can now and thinking this is the, the will of God in their lives. And I usually tell, if you really want to know the will of God, the step one to the will of God, it says it's his sanctification. So that's in order for us to know the will, you need to be sanctified by God. It, as I already mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, imagine if you take the cup, right? And you see the residue inside. You don't want to use that re- cup, particular vessel, right? The cup. You're like, hey, this is this is quite disgusting. Uh, of course, you guys know we have uh, paper cups, right? We can buy, use one time cup and toss it away. We have no, we don't put a, a value to that cup, right? Just one time use gun but then we have some ca- uh, cups that we value we wash them we put them back so if you want to be one time use cup go ahead got use donkey one time no problem he can use the cup as well uh, that one one use step a cup but if you want to be a vessel that you'll be reused again and that's where the word of god says sanctification where god desires and if you want to know your will well go to the sanctification process allow holy spirit god to sanctify your mind heart and soul 
Once he will do that, he will actually start giving you the vision of your personal life. He goes, hey, I want to Paul use you here. This is what I want to use you as. Now I washed the, all the residue, removed all the stains. Now I'm going to bring you to this stage. And while you'll be working there, I'll be using your vessel. There'll be new residue we'll, uh, we'll find. Because why? It's a, it's a continuous journey. But that particular residue, when you, he will sanctify you, he'll use you for another purpose again and again and again. So I think people, when people ask the question, young people, how do I know the will of God? Well, if you don't, if you're not being sanctified by God, if you don't go through the process allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you, then you will have problems. And I think w the comparison I would do, like I said, the paper cup versus a, you know, the mug, a nice coffee mug, right? Often enough, we go for the pick up paper cup idea. Well, I want to be used now. Just one time and be, be glorified. You know, God will glorify, you know, his name through me at the moment. But what about tomorrow? But what about after tomorrow? When about when you go through your hardships, do you want that cup to be tossed away? Do you want it to be reused and maybe not only reused, but actually being worked on as well? So I think this is the disconnect of our reality that we have. Completely different perspective of gospel. But also, I think... Um, the 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 kind of like the pursuit that we have seen where a lot of younger pe younger people are encouraged to do something great like do something change the world you know like and I think the older you get the more you realize that's like man um, you know as I was, I was very ambitious but I was also very naive right because if you are really gonna change the world it requires a lot of, of dying. Uh, it, it requires you starting with changing yourself first, right? And once you go on this endeavor of changing yourself, you know how difficult it is to change yourself. And this is why you need, you know, God to change you because most of the time us changing ourselves is 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 just disappointing, right? Like it's not a very good or very effective way, you know, because we constantly lie to ourselves and we give back into the old ways, Right. So we understand how difficult it is to change ourselves. And then, but all these younger people are sold on this idea that, like, oh, you have to go out there and change the world. Because, you know, John, I think it's 14, 12 says that you will do greater things. I think it says, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do works that I do and greater works uh, than these he will do because I am going to the Father. Right. So they take this, this verse, right. And they say, well, you, I'm going to do things even greater than Jesus. And, and like, no matter how you interpret that verse, it cannot mean what you think he means. Cause um, let's just say uh, you cannot save humanity like Jesus did dying on the cross. Right. So this idea that somehow you are going to be this, this uh, person in the middle. Now we've touched a little bit on this on the last podcast, but I want to do a little bit more elaboration on this because I think we're sold in this idea that we have to change everything and we have to change the world and we have to do great things for God. And as if God is going to look back, sit back and say, well, I've never seen that before. Right. And, and I do think that there's going to be some people that didn't necessarily change the world in the way that we understand it, but the way they walked with the Lord, the way they served, the way they, you know, develop their the fruit of the spirit and and so on in themselves they will be one day you know receiving a crown for 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 how they you know walk this christian walk even though a lot of people didn't look at them as this great man or woman of god yeah you know yeah i i, I if i may take a back a step um mm -hmm. you said young people we were trying to do something meaningful right because we have mm -hmm. that ambition to have uh something meaningful and i think we'll connect that to the john where it says mm -hmm. jesus will do greater work uh, than he did we'll come to it but i want to go take a little bit back uh, in 2006 um there mm -hmm. was a great i think uh, amongst the business world there was a great movement that started i don't know if you guys remember it was called um certified b corporation so mm -hmm. certified b corporation what happened um in 2006, there was a group of businessmen that got together and they decided because of young people and they decided, hey, a lot of young folks don't want to work meaningless jobs. So the whole idea for the company was certified B Corporation. That meant this a for profit corporation that has has a goal to benefit community and the environment. So that's what it means, basically, B, Corp, B uh, certified corporation. So that means company is has a greater goal than it's just profit itself. So a mm -hmm. lot of young people would be enrolled in those companies and want to work for that kind of company that they're 
accomplishing uh, for the benefit of community and the environment. So that is instilled in the humanity to do something greater besides just, you know, for their good. And I think that naturally falls into the Christian lives. So naturally, we want to do something that is meaningful as, uh, believe it or not, what society, and I like the title of your uh, podcast, Christianity and Culture, <laughs> if they collide together, believe it or not, we live in this physical world, right? So therefore, whatever we surround ourselves, so we will be either indoctrinated or be influenced in some way. And I think that comes into the churches instead of it's going from churches to the world, but it's it's reverting backwards. It's coming from the world to the churches. Let's do something that is more meaningful. And we might hurt seven main dates, seven mountains where we're trying to conquer things mm -hmm. and do things. Yeah. And I think that's where it's really closely connected to the idea of B Corporation. We even might call B Christianity, right? Do something that is very beneficial to community and very, very beneficial to the environment and my yeah. purpose and goal. And I think that's where we've been a soul the idea, hey, I'll let partner with the Lord. Let us be not just the sons of God and not being, being redeemed by him, but we are more than that. We are his partner. He we will do meaningful stuff with Christ. It's quite uh, uh, quite relevant within the communities of NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, or mm -hmm. idea that we are partnering. Therefore, if we are partnering and God has gave a commandment, they're saying, or instruction to go and conquer those things. Therefore, the John, when it talks about, and we'll do greater works than Christ is, we're basically elevating ourselves in the same pedestal like Christ, even greater things, because we're not just his sons and daughters, but we're partners in his kingdom. And in his kingdom, we ought to conquer every layer of that particular kingdom. And in that layer, they're saying, hey, it's arts and entertainments, right? They're saying it's a business, education, family, government, media, and religion. Let's go and conquer that. We'll do greater work. So I think there's definitely, as a B corporation has idea in this secular world, right? Do something meaningful. In the same way, we have kind of same correlation that we see in um, some church circles where well, let's do something that is more meaningful than just worship the Lord and, and get to know Him on a personal level. And uh, m missing the idea when you are being transformed, you've been born again, when you've been sanctified, therefore the Creator and the master, the ruler, the Lord, the master will take you as a vessel and use you. If that need to be in entertainment, he'll use you there. If that need to be at your work, he'll use you there. So your whole life will be that, you know, anything you do in your life, you will be to glorify God. Therefore, your new nature will doesn't have to, to go tell you, go conquer those areas of, of, of society. But your new nature will bring light to those particular circles of life whenever you go just as you turn on the light at your room and the light shines in every area of your room there's dust and mess it exposes same thing when you are believe being believer newborn again of christ you go at work you go to school and you people start recognizing and see that this man is not the same so therefore it does not require me to be concerned uh, if, if I'm certified B corporation or not, am I having a deep purpose and meaning in my life uh, to conquer those particular societies, seven mountains? I'm not obsessed with it because I know I'm a vessel. And if God decides me to take uh, put it in this particular circle, God bless. Let, let the Lord do what he wishes. He's the master of me, not me trying to figure out where am I suitable for my master? Do you see what I'm saying? Where I ask yeah, the question, yeah. Lord, you use me as you wish instead of, Lord, help me figure out and help you to tell you what I need to do kind of thing. Well, I, I, when I look at the um, kind of story uh, in the New Testament of John the Baptist, when he is imprisoned, sees he's cornered and he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the Messiah or should we wait for somebody else? And you're like, man, John, what are you talking about? You You've been proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. Your whole life mission was for you to proclaim Jesus the Messiah. But now you're asking if Jesus the Messiah. Well, what happened there was that he was cornered and he thought that Jesus is going to stroll into Rome, take over. So he had an idea of what the Messiah should look like. And Jesus wasn't fitting in his idea. And Jesus replies back and says, go tell John what you've seen, that 
you know, the the blind are receiving their sight and the good news is preached and so on, right? And I think uh, the the problem with this idea that we have to go take over the mountains of society, be it arts, entertainment, it's like, okay, no, you have an agenda and you're trying to use God to accomplish your agenda versus saying, I give up my agenda. I allow the Lord to change me. And as he changes me, that will impact the person right next to me. That will impact people on my job. So in the church context, what this looks like is, hey, I'm doing great things. I have to get on stage. Oh, I got to go on a mission trip. Oh, I got to, because those are big things. But then some somebody comes in front of you and you're like, oh, this person's not that important. They're just serving on our media team. So they're not that important. So I don't want to waste my time with this person because I'm on to these greater things. And it's like, what do, you, what do you mean? Maybe God ordained that moment with that person who is running media in your church because they're in need of something and you are there to, to that, 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 that is a divine appointment. So my problem is, okay, should we impact society? Absolutely. But that should be a result of our transformation. That should be a result of our sanctification. That should be a result, uh, sorry, a result of of God's agenda being implemented through us versus, oh, I just think this would be cool. So I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And I, th- I think I've seen it so many times where you have a speaker or someone who feels they're important and they won't, they won't go and talk to people or they will leave right after the service, right? Because they're not considering the personal one-on-one ministry as important as what they do on stage. Right, and we've seen evidence of that so in so many different churches. And my hope is that we understand that as God changes us, we will impact people around, you know. But ultimately, is us proclaiming Jesus that brings you know great things that come about, not us deciding, oh, I want to do a great thing. I have an agenda, and I'm going to use my you know my spirituality, my walk with the Lord to, to, to be another kind of like help in this agenda, like implementing things in my life, you know? Yeah. And and I think, uh, see, uh, we, when we look at the idea of, um, where did God mandate us, or let's say great, give us a commission to go ahead and take over those seven mountains of a society. We don't have anywhere. Uh, often enough, when we hear those kind of teachings, and they, if you actually press down and ask them, where do you get these teachings from? They'll go back to Genesis 1, 28 and say, well, that says there, God gave everything to a dominion. So idea that we need to dominate and take control over the society. Um, It's not a biblical idea. There is definitely one passage in Matthew where Jesus gives a great commission to us in Matthew chapter, let me see here, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He gives us a great commission. Uh, Go ahead, reach out to lost souls, preach the gospel, let them come to the salvational grace, get to know Christ on a a personal level. So that a great commission has been commanded to us. Go ahead and, and, and take that uh, discipleship, right? Baptize and teach them now. So baptize and teach them, it says here. There is definitely a a commission for us as a believers, but there is no commission from Christ and hey, go ahead and take dominion over the society. And I think that's where we misunderstanding. In 1940s, the United States, there was a movement uh, called Latter-day Rain movement. It was basically being taught that uh, whole idea that you and I ought to um, cast out demons, have all signs and wonders, and then we need to take over the society. And in 1940s, uh, I, I think, believe one of the Assembly of Gods, the uh, Assembly of God, they brought to the council meeting and they had conversation regarding this particular movement. And I like how they point out few concerns that they had. Wait a minute. Uh, we like that. We like the, the desire that people have to pursue Christ and they have a zealous uh, hearts and zealous minds and zealous spirit. But there's a dangers when people are fall, fall in one radical aspect where having all those gifts that need to be manifested. Well, what if you don't have those gifts manifested? Are you less liked by the Lord? Are you less uh, chosen? Are you less predestined? Are you less accepted? Are you less loved? What what are what are those what if you can't cast out demon for example never had, never experienced that are you being less now in a second class of citizens of Christianity? I'm not saying guys don't get me wrong I'm not saying we shouldn't be 
pursuing you know the gifts of the lord and we should be jealous what i'm saying is there is definitely a run approach if we only consume proteins as you mentioned if this is the only thing that we're chasing uh, just in 1940s uh, uh, latter reign where they were saying that we ought to do that when you say ought wait a minute brothers is this the whole essence of christian life is this the great commission to go and take dominion over you know, and said those yeah. things in our in our um, society. I think that's there's definitely definitely danger in it. But also, I think what goes along with that, and I think what allows for that to happen a lot of times is that people that preach this, they make themselves apostles. They make themselves people that cannot be questioned, right? Like, and and even though, like when when you mention ought, that to me tells me, okay, that's some kind of you know, uh, commission that God gave us, but we don't, we don't see that. We are told to go, you know, preach the gospel, disciple. Um, we are told to, to baptize, right? Like it's, it's that what we're told, not this idea that we, we gotta constantly pursue what I would say are miracles and signs and wonders and, and all of these things, right? If we put, shift our focus from preaching the gospel from seeing people baptized, you know, and we put it on kind of like the, again, like the highlights, uh, because somebody's getting demon delivered. Not, not, not that when somebody get, is getting demon delivered, that gets a crowd, you know. Um, but I think a lot of times, one of the reasons that these churches go unchecked or um, th this is allowed is because people who are in charge they made themselves like I'm the apostle, I'm the one who sets the standard. They cannot be questioned. They're the man of God, right? And almost, you know, if he was in the secular world, right? Like if you did something that is wrong, the secular world has no problem calling you out. And sometimes they'll use expletives to, to call you out, right? Like they're not going to put up with, if they feel like someone's lying, right? In the church, obviously, we are told to tell the truth with gentle love and respect because we're not in the world, right? But this idea that somehow we cannot question the, the guy, you know, who you know, is on stage. Well, they are fulfilling a role just like the rest of the body is fulfilling their roles, right? So, so discerning and checking one's theology and checking what spirit is this from, right? Like that should be done. I mean, Jesus checked, you know, Peter when he told him not to go to the cross and Jesus says, back off Satan, right? Like, you know, so this idea that somehow you know, that's a problem where when Apostle Paul goes and says the Bereans were checking everything and searching scripture, and he actually is is encouraging this, right? Uh, there's a uh, passage in Galatians 1.8 says this, but even if we were an angel from heaven should preach you to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So here you have you know, Paul writing to Galatians and says, if someone comes and tells you a different gospel, if someone comes and preaches something that's contrary to what we've already been preached, let him be accursed. I mean, that's some serious instruction, right? And here it's like, well, you can question the man of God. You can question. I, I mentioned to you right before the podcast that I saw TikTok where this guy asked, said, Apostle, and I don't remember he, the guy's name. And one of the comments in the in the TikTok said, um, "You lost me when you said apostle, right? Like, um, because because you know, even people who maybe don't go to church um, automatically they look at this kind of system that we have that the men of God cannot be questioned. And I'm like, wait a second, but we've seen so many men of God that have fell from grace, and had their church loved them enough to confront them." Had their church loved them enough to, you know, lovingly rebuke them, these these people would be even more um, preaching gospel, and they wouldn't be, you know, sitting down right now because they had a massive uh, integrity failure, right? So I think part of loving someone is to at times confront and at times say, "Hey, what you're preaching is not." What we see in scripture, it's contrary to what scripture says. So I'm seeing that a lot more and more where you cannot question the man of God and there's no board of elders. There's ministries with no checks on the guy who's in charge. And I think that's extremely dangerous. Um, you know, 
everybody's trying to build their own little kingdoms uh, while here being on earth. You know, sadly to say, you know, if we are not for the business uh, of our father, you know, father's business, then we ultimately will end up building our own little kingdoms. Just as you see, for example, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, right? They're building their own little kingdom. Uh, as you see any other kind of religion uh, structures, they're very similar. It's being surrounded by one ideology or one particular man. And in a cult, it's pretty much similar. Whenever it's becoming just where it's all around one particular person and that one, one particular person and gives the vision, cast out the vision, gives the, let's say, guidance to that particular group of people, that is a very dangerous position to be in. Uh, I believe um, for us as a genuine believers and Christians, we ought to have always uh, uh, the right posture before the Lord. Lord, am I doing this for my self gain or personal gain? Am I trying to build a kingdoms that have no walls? I mean, what I'm trying to do ultimately, I think this is the, the problem with the humanity is that we are genuinely trying to say, God, let me help you. Let me help you by doing this that you were trying to do, the Great Commission that you called us to do. Let, let us fix your problem. There is not a good strategy that you laid out in the Bible. Let us come up with a new strategy of how to attract the crowds, how to attract the people, how to bring them more to Christ by doing our methods and, and, and our techniques because you don't know quite well. And, and that's the problem. We're building our own kingdom, not the kingdom of God. Therefore, you might see in like Mormonism, right? They have a one particular main prophet that anything he says, anything he says cannot be questioned. I don't know if you know, but lately, uh, last several years, the Mormons no longer like to be called Mormons because uh, God appeared to prophet, current prophet and said, hey, uh, I don't want you to... Uh, Called, uh, I don't like when you being called Mormons. I want you to call Latter Day Saints now. So they changed everywhere the name from their website and every literature. They've been by reprinting a lot of literature, going away from being called Mormons, but calling Latter Day Saints. So idea of it's been ran by one man, if or at least been let's say looked up to the one man as a source of information, a source of knowledge, source of truth and guidance. That is a danger. Whatever it might be, a prophet or or proclaimed apostle or whatever that might be the title be careful run away from those circles whenever you have somebody between you and christ that is authoritative in a sense of uh where they cast out vision they cast out the truth so-called and they interpret the word of god and you need to be only in that circle to learn the word of god then run away that's what jehovah witness is jehovah witness they don't want you to read the bible at your home Jehovah Witness want you to come in a kingdom hall and sit and be taught by elders. You cannot, they, don't, they discourage you reading the Bible, but they will say, hey, use our literature to read at home, but not the Bible. Because they know once you start reading the Bible, the, the word of God says it's like, a, it's like a sword, right? It pierces down, it divides our heart, mind, soul. It actually exposes us all. And that's, there's a fear. Hey, don't do that. Because you might discover this is not right. So idea of let us keep, you know, you far away from the word of God as possible. And I think in circles of uh, progressive Christianity, the circles of NER, it's not maybe spoken uh, orally or figuratively, but it's been implied in it. Well, come to us. We have that information or let us be cast out that vision for you. And therefore people fall for young folks because they're hearing something new that are we, they never heard in the traditional churches or let's say particular churches. But this is something very new. Well, Pretty exciting stuff coming out, right? I can find out activation process of certain gifts or let's say how to have my purpose and will and destiny and know my you know calling of God in my life and all instead of indulging and getting themselves into the word of God. Well, I'll go drive through you know Starbucks and get this, you know, delivered to me right away with the just access of being there for 30 minutes or 40 minutes and I'm I'm good to go. That is a such yeah. a very scary line. Yeah, uh, actually, this this weekend I was interviewing for a job. Um, you know, I was trying to get a faculty job, and the 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 guy who, who's giving me interview he asked me, "So where do you fall theologically? We want to know, like, what do you stand?" And I was like, "Well, I grew up Pentecostal, uh, but and he's like, well, you hesitated. What's the bar butt part?' You know?" <laughs> and I told him, "I'm like, well, I just don't know if." I agree were like when in Pentecostalism 
you know, let's say there's some kind of deliverance service. And I feel like it's just kind of this very traumatic experience for the person that is coming to be either prayed for or delivered. And the the thing that I said was that I think if we're going to set ourselves as spiritual doctors per se, right? Like a doctor, a surgeon, when he has a scalpel, he doesn't have a chop saw, right? Like he has a, a scalpel and he's very intentional, right? With everything that he does when he does surgeries, right? So if we pray for people, if we um, preach the gospel, everything that we do, we have, there has to be uh, a very, um, if I can use the word, very careful, methodical, like very uh, intentional, right? Like if we're going to do any cuts, right? If we're going to correct people, right? If we're going to, um, you know, pray or, uh, I don't know, bring people on stage, it has to be very, very intentional. It has to be in, in a sense that's very, uh, you know, careful like like a doctor would be. What I've seen though is, a lot of people that are not trained now, of course, like, you know, training for me, at least going to university and it taught me how to do exposition of scripture. It taught me a lot of the basics, right? But a lot of times well, what I see in a lot of circle, the circles and churches is that people that are not trained, they don't know what they're doing, but they're causing these very traumatic experiences for people that come on stage, right? Or, you know, when they pray for them and they're yelling at them and telling them like, well, you haven't repented. Oh, you haven't dealt with your childhood trauma and all of these things. And I'm like, if you're going to say that, you better make sure that you are 100% right. Because saying those things, like, and not being very careful, one day you're going to have to give an account for how you ministered, right? You know, when I see videos of people being kicked and uh, I, and I've seen this and people and they attribute that to uh, the Holy Spirit led me to do this or you know I look at that and I'm like well how can you ever justify this right well the way they justify it is well this is what we, we were told by our prophet by our apostle and when I look at scripture you know the Holy Spirit is gentle you know is always you know now of course if you see some demon deliverance, that's sometimes not very gentle. But what I'm talking about is people who have accepted Jesus and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and now they act in a way that's very strange and, you know, with no self-control. And I'm like, well, one of the one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, right? One of the fruits of the Spirit is love, peace, joy, kindness, right? So... These need to be part of every day how we minister to people. You know, we always minister in truth. That's why I'm not afraid to be questioned. Anything that we've said on this podcast where if you walk up to me at any time, you can question me on my teaching or my preaching. I welcome that. And if I'm wrong, I hope that I'm in that moment, I, I repent, right? Because I'm not committed here to building my own kingdom and proclaiming my own truth. I'm here proclaiming God's truth. I'm here proclaiming God's kingdom. And if I need correction, I welcome that, right? And this is one of the things that makes me hesitate about a lot of these movements is when I think that things that are practiced in service or on stage are not biblical and somehow I'm supposed to defend that just because our pastor is saying it, that this is, this is the direction of our church now. This is our new vision, you know? Um, because here's all of that to say this, again, we are dealing with people's lives. We're not, you know, like I always like to say, we don't sell tractors. We are dealing with people's lives and, and what we do matters. What we do affects so many people in our church. So we better make sure that we're correct. We better make sure that we're very careful. We better make sure that when we do cut, we cut in the way that heals and it doesn't cause more damage. You know, it doesn't cause that person to be re-victimized. You know, they were victimized by their sin, by the enemy and all of that. What we don't want to do is cause more pain and suffering and cause people to be re-victimized in church where they're supposed to find hope, healing, and restoration. And I think that's the, the problem that I'm really, I struggle, man. I struggle with, with a lot of these things. When I see people leaving churches more hurt than they came in, I struggle with that.
Definitely. Um, I think that's part of the uh, spiritual abuse. Then when we talk about spiritual abuse, I think that's one of the things we touch base when uh, certain people, they come to receive healing and uh, find a genuine, uh, let's say, encounter with God and and therefore leaving after that a particular service or overall, you know, being in that particular circles, then they end up very hurt and uh, more in a critical position than they came in. And that's, I think it's quite dangerous. And I think in uh, having a discernment uh, for ministers, us young people as well, and having a conscience, if um, clean conscience, to, hey, are we doing this to help them out? Or is this to glorify our own uh, ministry or bring another checkpoint that, hey, God is with us? And often enough, see people validate those things. Well, see this happen, that means God is with them. Or see this crowd, or God is with them. Or see this miracle, God is with them. Basically, they're trying to correlate with the events uh, that is, hey, that's a proof that God is with us. And I say, guys, it's a, it's a very shallow idea of using any kind of experience to validate that God is with you. For example, uh, you know, I usually tell people and that kind of, um, I usually yeah. respond in a matter of often people say, well, isn't it God's will to heal everybody? And uh, I usually bring those two things together. Uh, correlation, God is with you and uh, God is doing everything that you can. Let's say all those signs and wonders and miracles in your church or your movement. That means God is with us or the number of people and idea of uh, error. God's will for everybody to be healed. I connect them together in the same fashion. So when I explain, and I usually tell them a story, and that story goes about the pe uh, person that had a, I believe I shared last time on a podcast, had a son, right? Two neighbors had a both sons. And ultimately, the, long, the, the uh, moral of the story, one son ended up being hurt, and the neighbor would always envy of what happened in his life, of other son life. At the end of the day, that son that got hurt, the neighbor not envied, but kind of laughed at saying, hey, look at that. You know, you thought it was a blessing, but now it's a curse. But li little did he know, later on goes on, uh, the crippled son that became the crippled man, uh, the guy was laughing at the man. He had a son as well, and he wasn't crippled. So when the war broke out, they took him to army, and uh, he went to war, fought off war, the one who wasn't crippled. So the ultimately, he saw as a curse. The man is a crippled, yeah. he has a curse now, but that became a blessing at the moment of trial and time where the man remained a uh, alive. So often we look, for example, we look at things that, well, hey, God grant him a building, that means God is with them. Or you see this particular miracle that proves God is with them. And I say, guys, it's not a sign for you to, uh, to have determination that God is with them or there's a certain blessing of God. And I said, God can use as a, for man, it looked like a blessing, but then it could be at the ultimately a curse for you. And then people say, well, that is a curse for him, but it's actually a blessing for him. So that is the idea. I'm saying, if, for example, um, if you might be having a certain sickness, right, in your life, but only you know inside the motive, why are you sick, right? Your heart is in your posture before the Lord and nobody else but besides God himself and you know deep inside Lord I, I think I know why you exposed me enough that I see myself like if you give me healing in that area I'll actually astray from you so therefore some people might look and say well wait a minute this guy doesn't have a healing in this area of his life but they think and it's a curse but yet from that person perspective it's actually a blessing that God is withholding it from him to go into a particular ditch, you know, spiritual ditch. So therefore, I said, guys, you, that's not the right measure to, to use and apply. Well, that's a blessing. It's a curse. Therefore, God is with them or God against them. Don't use, I said, that, that's... Yeah, I think as you mentioned that, I always see like a whole bunch of people with alarm bells going on, right? Like, well, no, God will not use sickness. But it's like, what about Apostle Paul when he says, to keep me from being prideful, the Lord gave me a, thor a thorn in the flesh. Right. And it's like, well, we don't know for sure. It could have been a spiritual thing. I don't know what exactly he meant by a thorn in the flesh. And I think a lot of people are still trying to figure that out. Right. But that could be a sickness. You know, he tells Timothy to take some alcohol for for his uh, frequent elements, which I don't recommend it now because we have medicine. But at that time, like the alcohol is what they had in, in you know, wine rather. Um and the, the, this is the stuff that I'm just like, there's plenty of, of times in the Bible, we see the book of Job, right, where God accomplished something greater, 
you know, even though he had to go through that, you know, just broken season of life, where when I think it was a blind guy that people are saying who sinned and Jesus says nobody, you know, but it's just for God's glory is that, you know, Jesus didn't heal everyone at the pool of Bethesda, right? Like he only healed that one particular person. So this idea that somehow it's never for God's will for you to be sick. Like I've, I've actually heard people say this. I'm like, are you sure? Because there's plenty of, you know, and, and then I've heard the response to this, which is like, well, Jesus is our perfect theology, not these people. And I'm like, well, in that case, you would have to throw everything in the Old Testament that happened to other people out. It's like, no, God worked throughout the Old Testament and New Testament and all these people and the way they went through, it's written to, for our benefit, right? So this idea that somehow all of our theology only comes from Jesus, right? And he's our perfect theology. And I'm like, well... Jesus also was in the Old Testament. He was the Word of God in the Old Testament, right? So, so this idea, it's like, man. So, how would you respond to that? That, like, well, we get our theology from Jesus, not from. So, just to clarify, for those who are maybe yeah. listening to the podcast and saying, "Hey, what, what Slav is mentioning, Jesus' perfect theology," basically, it, in a nutshell, um, Jesus' perfect theology is this: that. Uh, that we should have a perfect bodies and ultimately that we should have no sicknesses and things like that. That's kind of the, in the nutshell of uh, Jesus perfect theology, what it means. So the way I usually tell people, <laughs> um, we don't see that in the scripture, uh, Jesus perfect theology, that, that all of believers are, ought to be now physically healed and there should be no corruption in their uh, mortal bodies. And, and, and some actually go as far as believing that they have now immortal bodies. So in those kind of circles and so on, um, and as you'll tell them, until uh, we are being uh, giving a new glorified bodies with God, we will have struggles, we will have iniquities, our um, our bodies will have issues, and that's normal because the corruption came, and within corruption there's decay, and decay has a process to destroy. So therefore, our earthly bodies, our earthly temples, they will be decaying slowly. Um, therefore, it doesn't mean that my temple, physical temple, will be at always perfect condition. No way. But it means that the sustainer of my imperfect temple is God himself. So that means if I have a problem with my earthly temple, if I have iniquity, if I have a sickness, he is the sustainer. He's the one that able to bring me through this. It doesn't mean that my temple will not face any storm. It doesn't mean my temple will not face any, for example, hurricanes in life and floods in life, spiritually I'm talking about. But it means the sustainer of my temple, the one that resides in me, it says, we're the living temple of God. He'll able to bring me through. And you know, it's interesting that if you look at those who do preach the perfect theology of Jesus Christ, right? Themselves, they're going through those hardships. I, If you look at the history of a vineyard church, and look, the guy used to uh, preach that uh, every Christian should be healed. His best friend died of a heart, uh, um, ca uh, not cancer, but heart disease. And then himself, the founder, died with the sickness. And I think a lot of his theology being changed. And it's sad to see that when we believe in this perfect theology of Jesus, you know, that ought to, we, we, we shouldn't be having any sicknesses. And then when we're hit with this, we have a lot of answers that we need to give to those who are uh, been believing those circles. And my biggest concern I'm trying to say with this Jesus perfect theology that I believe we're causing more damage for those who try to live up to this standard and they still have imperfection and still have sicknesses and still have problems. And then they look back and say, wait a minute, how do I reconcile my relationship with God now? Is Am I less liked by God? Am I not being predestined? Am I not being chosen? And therefore, a lot of people, they're like saying, wait a minute, I'm not a atheist, but I, I, I will not call really maybe a, a agnostic, but I'm an offense. I'm closer to become agnostic, believe in some sort of deity. Because people go through that abuse, spiritual, and then psychological, and then theological, and they then basically leave those things, leave those communities and say, you know what, I don't want to do anything with it because they still have issue. And that's why this uh, responding to it, uh, that's not a right measure for us to look at it. And, but I think in a two, uh, if I may summarize and answer this way, sin came, there's corruption came. In corruption, there is decay. In decay, there will be a problems that are, it's a natural process. Uh, a lot of thermodynamics. 
right? Things are falling apart. Uh, so this is where it will, our bodies are falling apart. Our morality of a society is being decayed and degraded. So the word of God has forewarned and says, and it seems like the word of God is very on point to the humanity uh, of, of the stage of humanity. And it's been explaining this uh, idea of what's happening with us better than a man-made a doctrine and theology of Jesus' perfect theology. Well, one thing that stands out to me is like, it's not even logical because, you know, when people say things, they died of natural causes, but it's like, normally what they mean to say is either they died of, you know, um, some kind of clot or some kind of like cancer. So even people that pretty much anyone that didn't die of an accident, right? They usually die because of a problem in their body, right? So this idea that somehow that once you encounter Jesus from now on, you have to have a body that's fully healed. And I think insult to injury, it's usually said with people that at times wear glasses or, you know, they have other things in the Bible, uh, in, in, in their body, right? That you're like, wait a second, but if you're supposed to have a perfect body, why do you preach this and you still wear glasses, right? It just makes no sense, you know? So this idea that somehow you have to have a perfect body after you encounter Jesus, where this idea that you become perfect, well, that just eliminates the whole process of sanctification, of becoming more like Jesus and crucifying the flesh every single day. And it's, man, I, I think, like you said, it per, puts puts a massive burden on people who maybe are, um, you know, dealing with cancer. Uh, my, my aunt died of cancer, you know, and, you know, I know for sure that when she died, I mean, she died praising the Lord, which it makes no sense to me, right? But... Even in her her body falling apart, she's able to say, you know what? My hope is in the Lord, right? So, man, we're coming here up to a little bit more than an hour. And I wanted to ask you a final question. That is, what do you think pastors can do? Uh, and uh, I'll also kind of add to that. To uh, I mean, pastors, I've been a pastor for quite some time. And I think what's it's such a difficult job because no matter what you do, you're not going to please everyone. But I think we work in front of, of, of the Lord. And I think that is who primarily we need to walk in line with and please, right? And uh, what would you say to pastors that maybe are either intimidated sometimes or they want to become relevant and they don't want to like say something that will be not, um, maybe not as popular or accepted? Um, and I think also as a pastor, I can say it tends to be a very lonely place at times. And I think a lot of pastors, they will not speak up because, well, they don't want to be ostracized or, or ridiculed and, and so on. I would uh, say, you know, uh, first of all, as a pastor, uh, pursue Christ yourself, personal relationship, because I know you might get caught up with uh, delivering the message, preparing the message. And uh, running, for example, uh, mentoring people and counseling people. And uh, you've been giving a lot, giving out, giving out. But you need to be ministered to by the Lord, by Christ himself. The closer you get to Christ, um, the less residue you'll have in your cup. The closer mm -hmm. you get to him, the less hypocrisy you'll have within your own self. I'm not talking about looking at the hypocrisy of somebody else, but within your own self. And the more genuine you become towards yourself as well, you understand, hey, I need more grace of God in my life more than my uh, people do at my church maybe. And then people genuinely start recognizing that, that you are living, not only living, but you're at the living testimony of what you've been preaching. So your preaching becomes a action by your lifestyle. So I think that is very important to our, that our lives will become a, those particular, like a reading um, vessel or book that people can read. Uh, and then the words that we'll say, they will sometimes add to that particular subject or that particular message. Uh, because we think the words are the main communication tools we have, but I'd say the actions and our lifestyles are definitely bigger than uh, just the uh, words that we sum up. And one thing, and the second thing I would say, don't afraid to maybe have um, 
conversations with your audi- uh, with your congregation regarding, for example, church history, uh, different teachings within church history, uh, uh, different doctrines, how were they born, how they came, in challenging their beliefs in that sense, or let us go and bring it to the light, and we should examine the Word of God as we uh, read in First uh, John. It says that we start beloved and do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see whether they're from God. Not being afraid to do that, to go and examine that. And he says, hey, let's check it out. Let's see. Based on the light of the word of God, is this what it means? What the pe- people preach? Not be afraid. Don't don't be afraid to bring up those things. People have questions in those areas. So I tell them uh, that's what would be my, my recommendation um, yeah. to them. So. I also want to say a few things here that uh, I think growing up, I have never had one of those testimonies. Just like, man, I was a drug addict and I did this and that and that and that. And and then you and then Jesus came and everything changed. Like, right. So when, whenever I heard that, I was like, man, I wish I had like a powerful testimony. And I'm like, no, my testimony has mostly just been being in church, you know. But then I was talking to a friend and I think they mentioned this and they're like, well, sorry, but that is an awesome testimony. The fact that the Lord has kept you, you know, the, the the fact that like the Lord has worked in all these years faithfully, right? Whenever you felt like giving up. And I think same thing happens in churches a lot where we want to attract a crowd based on, oh, we have really exciting things and people's lives and, and, and you want to make some good videos of all the crazy things that are happening during a service. But one of the best testimonies you can have is have a a legacy of being faithful in who you are as a pastor, who you are as a husband, who you are as a, as a, just a friend of, of the people that you disciple and who you are as a discipler, right? Like who you are as a teacher, who you are as a preacher. And I think a lot of people want to see a lot of demonstrations, right? Like of big, big things that happen. But I think, one of the greatest testimonies for any person is to have that consistency, not the fireworks, not the big events and the big conferences and where everyone's just raw, raw, but then everything just dies down. No, it's, it's a life well lived. When I look at people like uh, Ravenhill, right? Like Leonard Ravenhill or David Wilkerson, right? Like, or I, I think in any camp you go, or even Billy Graham, right? Like, you go in any camp and you you see a life that was consistent, you know, in, in walking with the Lord and being a good husband and a good father and being a, you know, a good evangelist. It wasn't so much about the big show and then nothing to show for it after, right? So my encouragement is to you, to you is, is, is to, you know, engage in constantly, you know, preaching the gospel, preaching scripture walking daily uh, with the Lord and live a legacy of 40, 50, 60, 80 years of walking with the Lord. It might not be as exciting as what it's portrayed in the media or in all the big conferences, but I think really what God values is that, is, is the 80 years of being a faithful servant of, you know, in a stewardship, uh, in steward of, of, of his, um, you know, call in, in his calling in your life. So, yes, sir. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on the podcast, man. I'm sure there's going to be a part three, <laughs> um, but uh, there's also going to be some events. We're, we're hoping to put some events together, um, you know, uh, in the future um, and we'll advertise it uh, if you want to attend some of the, the events, but um, we want to encourage the, 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 the local church and we, we love the local church. And I think one of the best things you can do is attend a local church, but remember, you know, allow the Holy spirit to be your teacher, you know, uh, practice the basics, you know, majors in the basics of, of our faith. Anything else you want to add, Paul? Um, I'll say maybe if they would like to send their questions, maybe we mm-hmm. can address some questions that they have. Yes. I know some people have been texting us back and forth. Um, I think it would be great for us to kind of sum up some questions and maybe next time uh, I've got given yeah. opportunity, we can at least address some questions. Um, but one thing I like I would mention, uh, as you point out, grow in Christ naturally, guys. Uh, 
basics are the key you know don't try to go snowboarding if you actually don't know basics of balancing you know so things like that or trying to be a player let's say nba if you can't even just dribble or i mean just hold the ball in your belt so keep those things in mind they're natural processes that you got to go through and don't get discouraged if you see your brother let's say shooting hoops and you can't doesn't mean you're incapable of that means you just got to grow in it so like I said, don't fall in those traps of, wait a minute, I don't have that particular gift activated yet. Therefore, I need to run for it. Natural growth, guys. All right. Well, thank you so much. God bless you guys. Until next time, take care.